to uh, my garden party. Uh, I was out here just enjoying the beautiful weather. Isn't this a gorgeous place to have a garden party? Hello, my name is Elizabeth Little Campbell and my father was William Little, an early settler of Delaware County. He had a dry goods store right, over, store right over there on the corner of North Sandusky Street. My father acquired a lot of land in West Delaware. He owned everything from William Street to Central Avenue and from Liberty Street over to King Avenue. Now, King Avenue used to go straight through to Central Avenue and it was the edge of town. However, King Avenue also used to be called Lewis Street. My father named the street for his son, Lewis, and he named a street for my mother, Catherine, and my two brothers, George and John, and a street for me. He even named a street for my mother's family, the Woodses. Now, my father also bought farm lots in Delaware. He bought 80 acres from Thomas Butler. He brought farm lot three and farm lot four. And he, that took his boundaries all the way to Oak Hill Avenue and west to Gruber Street. And then he bought farm lot uh, one and two to the south of that and farm lot 19 clear to the west of one, two, and three. And this is illustrated right here, they turned my maps around, right here um, on the Delaware County 1875 Atlas. Uh, my father operated an eight acre uh, blue limestone quarry on farm lot three. St. Peter's Episcopal Church was built out of this little blue limestone in 1844 and I'm very happy and proud to say that my husband George W. Campbell and I were the first wedding in that particular church and my parents also built for us a beautiful home on the corner of, uh, William, of Winter Street and Catherine Street that you today know as the Arts Castle. Unfortunately, in 1844, my father passed away. And this tract of land with the quarry was inherited by George and me. Uh, unfortunately, George was more interested in horticulture than he was in the quarry. So my brother, George W. Little, uh, operated the quarry until the 1890s. Now George lived right over there on the corner of Winter Street and King Avenue. During the same time, we also sold off lots and we established the Campbell Little Addition. In 1853, we sold seven acres to the Female Seminary College or Ohio Wesleyan, known as Manette Hall. In 1893, I transferred my property over to my two daughters, Bessie Brenneman and Catherine Butler. However, they didn't hold on to it for very long and they transferred it very quickly over to their brother, Frank Little Campbell. Now, you will know Frank because he's the one that built the beautiful house over on 24 Montrose Avenue that was designed by a very famous Ohio architect, Frank Packard. And also, Frank had a beautiful granddaughter, Mary Catherine Campbell, who was Miss America, not only once, but twice, in 1922 and 1923. Now, as I said before, Frank operated the quarry from the 1890s to the 1920s. The sisters transferred it to him in 1921. In the 20s, however, even though Frank operated it, owned it, it was operated by the Samuel C. Kistner family under the name of the Delaware Blue Limestone uh, Company and later 
under the name of the Olin Tangy Stone Company. Now, unfortunately, Frank passed away in 1924, and he had two sons, Dudley and Herman. Dudley and Herman had very responsible jobs, and so they lived out of Delaware. So the quarry was transferred to the Delaware National Bank Company in 1930, thus ending generations of family that owned and operated the Blue Limestone Quarry after it was transferred to the Delaware National Bank Company. Welcome, and my name is Jan, and I'm going to be reenacting Bessie Campbell today. And um, I'm going to be portraying her, and then I'll drop out a character and, and, and t tell you some stories that she wouldn't know from her lifetime. And she goes back to 1856, died in 1829. And she was the daughter of uh, Catherine Little Campbell. So um, after I um, drop out a character and tell you some of these stories, then I hope that you'll have some questions for me at the end. Hello, my name is Bessie Campbell Brenneman. And I understand you've been talking with my mother. She was a wonderful woman. She gave this land to me and my sister, Catherine. And we own property uh, to the south of here. We ended up selling, we uh, sold many lots and we transferred ownership to um, all the, the land except the eight acre quarry um, to um, our brother Frank. And Frank operates uh, the uh, quarry for the family. <clears throat> we, in, we eventually transferred ownership of uh, the eight acre quarry as well to Frank in, in, eight, in 1921. And on your next stop, you'll hear more about quarry operations and what that was all about. Now, you may be wonder, why did we come all the way back to this part of the property to um, hear about Bessie, one of the owners? Well, I want to tell you about the railroad. And I picked this spot because you can see the sky behind those high trees over there. That's the railroad track. Now that railroad went in in the early 1870s, but back in 1852, my parents sold land to um, the Springfield, let's see, Springfield Mansfield uh, Railroad to put in a connector down south, down to um, Depot Street and um, uh, Toledo Street area and Park Avenue area, um, and so um, that was a connector to the railroad on the east side. Well, we needed a railroad over here, and so my sister and I transferred some property to the uh, Columbus and Toledo Railroad, and they put in this line here, a single track. They put in a trestle, and now it's time to look at this, uh, I'll point out the map. First I'll just say that the, the trestle bridge was built to go over Delaware Run. Now Delaware Run is very close down here. And you see that path that veers to the right and then goes into the bushes? Well, there's an open spot just over there, and you can see Delaware Run and the tunnel very close to that wood the woods there. So we're going to pass this around and I want to, um, when you get this map, you can see, now I grew up in the, in the, on Elizabeth Street and Winter Street where my mother Elizabeth, I was named after her but they called me Bessie, um, with the big stone tower. It's uh, made out of blue limestone 
and you come down here you probably came into the part into um, the tour today well we're up here this is the this is the north south line here and when you look at this picture you'll see there's some hash marks there that's a trestle bridge have you you seen trestle bridges mm -hmm. before so it's cross members of wood well that only lasts so long that's an 1890 aerial view by 1895 the railroad replaced the trestle with an embankment and that's what you have today and if you do walk down and your, your guide here will tell you if you have enough time, otherwise come back some other time. But you will see it's laid up quarry stone. It was very handy, so it's, it's uh, solid. By 1906, we increased the size of the railroad property and they put in a second line. So there's two tracks going through. Now you might say, well, what was, what's on the other side of the railroad? There was another, there's, there is, is another quarry there. A Mr. Hazelton owns a two and a half acre quarry. He's a local contractor, builds streets. He's got his sons working in, con in taking contracts all over the place. One of his sons makes those uh, textured concrete blocks that you'll see. Uh, sometimes whole buildings made out of, out of these textured blocks but uh, often it's the foundation that it's made out of. So now I'm gonna drop out a character and I can speak about newer things. Well, one of the things about this place, which became a, a park, and you'll hear much more about that, um, a lot of people say it's haunted. And I think we all believe in ghosts at Halloween time, but there are, there's a hundred years worth of stories about seeing, um, going down to the tunnel, even on a hot summer night, it's cold in the tunnel. And um, a couple of folks were down there one evening and they saw a young woman. They were in the tunnel and they saw a young woman on the other side uh, walking back and forth in the moonlight. And she started walking toward them. And as she came into the, into the tunnel, she's actually walking on the water, but her feet don't get wet. And she gets close to them and she disappears into thin air. Another story is that there was a train wreck in 1927. And uh, funny thing, I haven't found any newspaper articles about that one, but Evidently, there was a passenger uh, train wreck, and at least one passenger train ended up in the water, and then people heard squealing wheels and screams, and they could see lights glowing from uh, deep in the water from the train cars. And um, they, uh, they'd see apparitions coming up out of the water and also disappearing into thin air. My last story is, it's actually a true story, and it goes back to 1937 when there was an Ohio Wesleyan student about to graduate. This was in May of 1937, and she, <coughs> and she, um, she disappeared. There was an extensive search for her. She was from Northern Ohio. There was a, a search for her and they didn't find her. Now, her car was found in Delaware, so it wasn't like a carjacking, if, if they even knew that in those days. We have um, a longtime neighbor, Ginny Barber, who was a teenager back then. And she talks about how she and her friends came and uh, kept up with the the story and um, they um, and, and Jenny remembers the uh, the student driving around town in a red car now this is the article that talks about this and on the right side you'll actually see uh, Jenny called it a sports car and that looked like a sports car to me but red <laughs> cars it definitely was red and red cars 
were not very common in the 1930s. But um, Ginny and her friends came and inspected when they, they drained the quarry. By then it was parkland and they, they drained the quarry and found nothing. There were just some junk, old tires, a few old sides. They never found her. And never she, found it's a cold case. It's a cold case. They did not find her. Okay. Well, she's probably wandering around the <laughs> Yeah, that's right. So, um, questions that Bessie might have raised. Like, what's the name of the railroad today? And um, I haven't heard a train since I got here, but we're bound, by the time you leave tonight, Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's bound to be a train. See if it says CSX on it. That's the current, the current company that owns this railroad line. <laughs> well, that's CSX. What yesterday doing? Yes. Yeah. What I'd like to do now, I'm going to portray Frank Campbell first, until he died in 1924. And I'll on another six years after that. He's either his ghost or his name. So. so my name's Frank Campbell, and I operated this quarry. 25 years starting in the mid 1890s. Prior to that, my uncle George W. Little operated it and he retired and moved to Cleveland, so I started on the port. Before we start talking about the port itself, let's talk about geology. So, for millennia, this area was covered by a sea, a large sea that covered the Midwest. And over millennia, the sediment built up the mammals and bones from fishes and animals and sediment that would build up on the bottom. And over a long period of time, you really wound up with four layers. You had the top layer with more shale and clay. Then you had a layer of really nice fine grain limestone. And then below that was limestone, but it was more crystalline. It wasn't as fine grained or it wasn't as dense. And then below that there was a layer called Monroe, which really isn't of any use. The Monroe layer was kind of above sea level, below sea level, it moved around a lot. And the bottom of the sea wasn't flat like you would think of it today. It was really a mountain and hills like southern Ohio. So all these contours of layers of sediment were going up the sides of these ridges. And then the glaciers came through and smoothed everything out. And what it is, it left layers of sediment close to the surface in different areas. So if you go out to Allen Creek, Delaware County, you have a lot of shale near the surface. If you come to around the Olentangy River, we had more blue limestone, really fine grain limestone, close to the surface. And as you went west out towards the Scioto River, you had more crystalline limestone. And the difference is fine grain limestone is really good for architectural purposes, where the crystalline limestone was more for gravel and aggregate, for road building and concrete and these kinds of things. Um, the, and in the area where it popped up, it had different hues. So here it was kind of a blue hue because it popped up in Delaware. It was called Delaware Line, Delaware Blue Limestone. Um, the limestone here, this layer, was about 40 to 50 feet deep. And that starts really up at the railroad. So the actual depth is, sometimes you see these quarries are 40 feet deep, but I don't think they're that deep because the layer, they got into the, uh, crystalline layer of concrete, and that's kind of one we stopped for me. That's kind of getting ahead of the story. Um, so, in the early 1840s, I think when you were talking to my mother, she explained that my grandfather, William Little, started the quarry operations here. And he died shortly after that, and my uncle, George W. Little, operated the quarries. And back in those days, they did a lot of sawing of architectural elements of the fine green limestone was here. It was used for foundation blocks, it was used for walls, um, it was used for lintels above windows and brick houses and sills on doors and windows and then curbing you'll see is limestone, uh, steps. There are a lot of applications around Delaware. Um, in my uncle's era some of the key buildings that were built in Delaware with this limestone included the Asbury United Methodist Church, which is up on Lincoln Street and Franklin, and University Chapel, Great, Great Chapel University Hall, and Merrick Hall at Ohio Wesleyan. Um, 
my uncle also he advertised that his, his brother, my other uncle, William S. Little, had a grocery store in North Sandusky, and he would advertise you could drop off your orders at his store for the different products that you want. So as I said, my uncle managed this until the mid-1890s, and then he retired and moved to Cleveland, and I took over operations at Detroit. In those days, we had a stone crushing plant, which was on the other side of the railroad track, and that would use hammer mills to basically make small rocks out of big rocks, and it would feed the limestone through. And over here, about back here, we had a stone sawing plant, which where we would use metal saws. You could saw sandstone, you could do it by hand with a two-man saw, limestone, and we used the mechanized saw to cut it into slabs and different shapes depending on what people wanted. In 1880, my uncle filled out a survey about manufacturing in Delaware and gave some facts about his quarry here. He said he started it in 1860 and he had about $3,500 invested in it. He said um, he had quarried 10,600 cubic yards of limestone out of this quarry and that everything was transported by wet horse and wagon and that he basically sold locally. Even though he had a railroad up here, he really didn't use the railroad to ship anywhere else in the country. He had uh, 20 men working for him. They worked 10 hours a day in the summer, eight hours a day in the winter, and then in, they made, skilled mechanic made $2 a day, and the labor, laborer made $1.10 a day. And I should have asked, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure can. You're close. Um, so also, my sister may have mentioned that a gentleman named Wayne Hazelton had a quarry on the other side of the railroad tracks. He had about a two and a half acre quarry, and we shared the stone crushing plant. Wayne was a contractor. He did a lot of street work here in Delaware. Um, and we had, of course, we had tracks going back and forth from his quarry over to here so we could use the stone crusher. Let's skip through that. We had um, tracks, you saw, the, you saw the run tunnel. So we had tracks going through that, we would move carts of stone back and forth between the quarries. Um, so Wayne was an interesting guy. He had uh, bought, he bought land from my parents earlier on down on Park Avenue, and he built a saloon and a house there at the corner of Park Avenue in Toledo. And stepping out of character, his great-grandson, great-great-grandson Chet Hazelton still lives in the house. And has been working on it, trying to restore it. So, um, it's a cool looking house. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah. He's really got a lot of nice work inside. Yeah. He's got a lot of records too. So we're going to do a Hazelton program. I hope next year. So, um, so anyway, we have this picture of Wayne's quarry. Send her out. It shows the the tracks and the cart. And I think this was close to 1910 when he's kind of when he stopped quarrying over there. We don't. And then. Uh, we really don't have pictures of this quarry in operation, but there was a large quarry up in Fulton, Ohio, which is just south east of Mount Gilead on Ohio 61. And there's a whole lot of photos of that from 1892 and that era. And I'm going to pass around. It gives you a good idea. So the way we would get blocks of limestone would be we would drill from the top a series of holes, and then we would insert wedges in those and with sledgehammers break off a chunk of limestone. When we talked about sediment layers, it wasn't like a solid 30-foot you know, section of limestone. There were actually small layers of shale and other things interspersed in there that would be a natural break for that block of stone. That's how we actually got the blocks and then we would saw them. We had to move those back in those days and we didn't have bulldozers or cranes. So they used something, and I've got a picture of it called a jack leg crane. Have you ever seen that? So basically they would put a hole in the, in the, in the uh, quarry bottom and stand a big telephone pole like up, up in that and then anchor it at the top with cable. And then you had a lifting arm that was hinged at the bottom and connected with a block and tackle and ropes so you could basically lift and lower and pivot. So they would, this has a, it shows how many of those they had in this quarry to move stone in different places. And then it could be done manually, but then later they would have boilers because they needed steam to run pumps because the quarries, you're always pumping water out of the quarries. So, you can, you can that so when we talked about the geology, it was important to be near the surface because the deeper you went, 
the more springs you hit, the more water came in, the more water you had to pump. And you did that with steam to, to drive a turbine pump, which meant you had more, more cost to keep the boiler going. So that was, that's why you saw a lot of chlorine close to ground. So you see from the ladder, that'd be a kind of an easy place to get hurt in a quarry like that. Um, that brings me up to really about 1919, which is when I stopped running the quarry and I contracted with a guy named Samuel Kissinger and his family. Looks like the 605 is right on top. Um, so in 1919, I contracted the quarry operations to Samuel Kissinger and his family. And he was a, another contractor in Delaware and he'd done things building abutments, you know, we lost so many bridges in the flood of 1913 that there was a lot of work rebuilding those bridges and Kistner was one of the contractors that did that. So he started the Delaware Blue Limestone Contracting Company and was operating this quarry. And in 1920, he was cited by the city for unlawfully exploding dynamite in the city. Oh, yeah. And they fined him $25 in court costs. So, so then, uh, I think he was in some financial issues about 1925 because he basically restructured a whole new company, the Oil and Energy Stone Company. And I died in 1924. So the story goes on that I left it to my two sons, Herman and Dudley. They were not living in the area and I don't, they weren't really interested. So Kistner quarried till about the late end of the 20s. And at that point they were at the bottom of the blue limestone. So what was left was the crystalline, which was basically all they could do was gravel. There wasn't any structural limestone they could do. So by 1930, they stopped quarrying. Kistner sold the company to another quarry down on the south end of Delaware, opposite of Bell Avenue, intersects South Sandusky Street, down the hill to the river. It was a Blue Quarry, and it's also locally known as Kistner Quarry. And you can still see some of that on Stratford Road next to the Ravines Trailer Park. That's the lake that's left from that quarry. So in 1931, my two sons handed this over to the bank, the Delaware National Bank, and they owned it all through the 30s. And it was really a swimming hole. It filled up with water because there were no pumps running. This became a swimming hole for local people and the Wesleyan students. They would come down and sun themselves on the rocks, and the guys, mostly the guys, I guess, would go swimming. They had some, there's some pictures in the dispatch, it's sort of like a funky board with some stones on the end, some kind of a makeshift diving board. <laughs> well then what happened was the uh, Delaware Recreation Department started taking care of this in the, about 1936-37 and one of the, the uh, lifeguards proposed putting these concrete bases in so we'd have a couple of diving boards on this end. So, and that's what they used during the 30s and when you go to your next step you're going to hear a lot more about the swimming and the park and everything else. So can I answer any questions? Did you pay that heron to stand there? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, herons are cool. So that's when they come in and land. Yeah, yeah. he's been there. I understand it. This is your last stop. Um, I'm, uh, by the way, I am William Tilton. I have that Tilton Transfer Shipping Company over there on the other side of town, over there on Lake Street, across from the Big Four uh, Railroad Station over there on Lake Street. And I purchased this property in 1941. And before I even purchased the property, in fact, during the 1930s, I had a riding stable down here. I had those, those stables up there, closer on that hill over there. Also built a cottage over there of about three rooms. Used to have club meetings and different kinds in there and all kinds of events in there. But they used to ride all over this park. We had paths riding all over the park. And then I had people to come in and take care of them. And then they would walk them after the weekends around because the people rode them to death a lot out here. So, uh, so it was really something for that. That sort of gave me the idea that really now that the quarry was no longer being quarried, this might be a great place to have a lot more than just riding stables out here in this area. So that's why I got things all started up out here. I can tell you though that back in the 1930s, the West Lynn students in May 
would come down here. A lot of times just before their, their final exams, oh, they, the women would pour out of that dorm up there and come down here and they would sunbathe and swim out here. Now they called it at one point the polar dip. They called it the polar dip because it was still May, you know, and the water is cold. And usually the women weren't doing much of it, but the men were coming down here and they were jumping out here in this water and they were swimming around. Now, I, they may have called that the polar dip, but I can tell you this. I don't care if it was May or mid-August. That water is cold. That spring-fed water that's filling up in those quarries there. You know, and eventually then they come along and the city starts up an actual swimming area. You may have seen that, uh, that diving board remains over here. And they also had diving boards over here. And they had the swim bathhouses right over in here. So this was really a popular place. In fact, I think you have a picture there that shows, if I may, yeah, thank you. And you're welcome to pass this around. There's a, a view of it when they are getting ready to really do some work down here on Blue Limestone. But here's an ad that was in some of the yearbooks and some of the advertising about it. It says Blue Limestone Lake Recreation Center. And it shows the ramp going out there. A ramp going out there. But the thing about that ramp was this. The thing about that ramp was it was filled in with stone because before there really wasn't any dividing about that area. But they decided that they needed to keep this area for swimming over here and this area for the boats, for boating and fishing out in here. But that's the way that was all set up. Now, back before it was even official, back in the 30s, there was a guy by the name of Bob Stair. Bob Stair had himself, has a, he has that carry up, you know, downtown down there. Bob Stair, back in the 30s, caught a five pound, six ounce smallmouth bass, 21 inches long, that hit the papers around the state for, for that catch. It showed him with that fish and all. Yeah, Bob Stair was something. He had that, uh, he, had his, he was a nice guy, but my gosh, Every time he would take, I, I don't know, maybe you already know this, he'd take his dog Prince into the hamburger inn down there, set it on a stool, and then he had something to prop it up so that the dog could eat off the counter. And then when it was done to clean the counter, the dog would lick the counter and sit there right beside me. I, I just, well, I'm off the subject, sorry. Back to blue limestone here. Now I can tell you that during the time when this really got started in the 1940s and on, we had all kind of activities down here. Horseshoe pitching, we had roller skating, we had ice skating, we had dances down at the pavilion down here at the end with the jukebox down there. Then we set up the ball field down here. Uh, it really got started and then when I finally retired, and I was needing to get rid of the property, and so I was going to sell it back, to offer to sell it back to the city for $17,000, which was a fair price. And the thing was, they just couldn't come up with it out of their funds. I'll tell you, I wish I, I wish you were down here right now. He was down here a little bit ago, but he, he left because he said he, he had to go home and make a phone call before the other person left the house or they wouldn't get the call. And I've been telling them they need a phone booth down here because how are you going to call anybody if they don't have a phone booth? Anyway, he left. Before he left, I said, Bob, give me some of those figures you were talking about on this. He was telling me that the community effort, and he was in charge of that community effort to turn this place into a real a real show place and he said seventeen thousand dollars they are going to come up with is what they needed glenn way and his company they gave six thousand four hundred dollars he said ohio western university five thousand dollars others were giving four thousand five hundred and eighty five dollars 
And then there were organizations giving $1,825. And then there were also other firms around town that were given $1,372,000. It was way over the $17,000 that they needed. They did very well. The other thing I'm amazed at is the number of service clubs around this community that really pulled together. The JC's organization, they actually set up the whole thing down here. And they were the ones who not only, you paid to get in the JC's, then they raised money in the community, and then they raised the money so that they themselves could build the thing, the ball field. They put together the whole thing, graded it, drained it, put in the big lights. They're the ones who are responsible for that, and that looks like they put, they've taken that darn ball field out of there and they put the, the basketball things in there. I don't know when they did that. Anyway, that was quite a ball field right over here. And in fact, I could, you know, I picture going out William Street out here and then coming back from some friends at night, and it might be later at night, and I'd always look over the second I cross those tracks down in here, see if the lights are still on. If the lights are still on down here, they're still playing ball, that might be 11, 12 o'clock at night. And you didn't just come down here and play on your own. They had leagues that went all evening long, and you really had to have an organized setting. There were so many people playing softball and so many people coming down here to watch softball. They even had one time I think the king and his court came down here. Uh, he was a well-known softball player that traveled the country and I, they also had a group called the Queen and the Court. I know they came here and the Queen was a fast ball pitcher of softball. So hard that she only had a catcher she had a couple people in the outfield, but they wouldn't stand up, they'd sit down. And then she had a couple other players. And then they'd take on the best of your town. And the reason they sat down is nobody ever hit her. <laughs> she was that good. Same was true with the Kingless Court. In other words, they had the best, and boy did they have a crowd when they had them down in here. This was really quite a place. In 1955, I, as I say, I had retired and I went on down to Florida, but I've come back here to see it one more time here. I mean, it was such a uh, great memories of coming down here. And it looks like they've done pretty well here by uh, putting in some courts. I missed the ball field, but they put in some, some uh, courts in here. And uh, of course, the JCs, I know they built all those shelter houses that are not only here but all over town they built them and anyway it's been great having you here and thank you all for coming back to this location and I could uh, I can answer any questions if you had any questions well that's good <laughs> did you have a question no I don't okay I thought that was a there we go, yes. It's probably pretty worthless, but when I, in the 50s, early 60s, I remember the softball teams that played down here were from the industries around. Yes. And these guys were like semi-pro. Yes. My they were good. My one of them. It was incredible ball. Down. It was. It was really good ball down here. High school used to play their tournaments down here also. It was, uh, it was quite a thing to come down here with all that. Well, you've been a very polite audience. You've been a very nice group to have back here in town, and I appreciate you coming down here to see us today.